Hey guys, welcome to System Design Fight Club. Today we're going to be going over the design for a voting service. Uh, it's a live voting service, like the ones that you'd run for um, the Super Bowl, where um, they might like have this poll going for like what team do you guys predict is going to win uh, this game or something. And um, for the Super Bowl, they have a uh, hundred million people watching. And um, if you have 10% of people complete a poll that is shown, that would actually be about 10 million people. And um, we, you, I, if, if they do that all within a single commercial break, you're gonna be getting a very high volume of, um, of uh, write operations. Uh, so it's, it's, this is gonna be a really fascinating scaling problem today. Um, and it's, it's more of like a poll uh, so I don't think voting, uh, the, the integrity of the vote is exactly as crucial in this problem as it would be for like the, the U.S. presidential election or something like that. So I'm going to assume that integrity of the vote is a little bit less strict in this case, uh, but we're going to care a little bit about real-timeness, and so that is possibly even a little bit of a trade-off that we're going to see with this problem. I've come up with a couple of different approaches for how we can go about trying to crack this. And... Um, I've already kind of looked at the numbers beforehand. Um, I don't like to go into capacity estimates a ton. Um, we can go ahead and dive into the numbers briefly before we go ahead and switch over to the diagram. Um, actually, I should talk about the requirements a little bit more. It's so again, a live voting service. Uh, you can vote for two teams, who's gonna win. Um, we're gonna handle duplicate voting um, without the voters having to log into anything. Um, so again, uh, how much do we care about the integrity of the vote? A lot less than for the U.S. presidential election. Um, and we want to display the results in real time. Eventual consistency is fine here. Um, it's not the U.S. presidential election. It's just who do you guys predict is going to win for this, uh, for this football game? So it's, it's uh, totally fine if some people's votes don't actually go through or they don't show up right or something like that. Um, yeah, so that's the requirements. Any questions before we move on to the numbers here? Okay, assuming it's a timed vote, um, voting closes in a set time. Okay, so that is actually a good question. Um, I actually wasn't even really considering that. I was just kind of like leaving it as like open ended. Since it's, um, I, I guess it'd be more accurate to describe the problem as more of a poll than a vote. I think I saw that in the Discord channel beforehand is that we're considering a little bit more of a, a poll than a vote because it's it's more about like getting a feel for um, what the average viewer is thinking the, the result is going to be rather than um, trying to get like a strict, um, super high integrity um, result of a vote where like everyone's uh, opinion has to be. Um, counted properly, and it would be, you know, a, a, a total um, catastrophe if anyone's voice isn't heard properly. Properly, um, so uh, low integrity on this is what I was thinking, um, and um, that didn't answer the question. Um, is it closed ended or open ended? I'm I'm thinking it's open ended, and you just kind of like, you can kind of have it handle both is that, um, so when you first show the poll and request for people to vote, um, you're gonna have like a peak, like right afterwards. It's uh, as soon as you show that the poll is open, you're gonna have like a bunch of people are, are first gonna look at it. You might have some people on like a tail end that like take a couple of minutes to actually fill it out. But I think that um, you would have a pretty quick reaction. If you run the poll over multiple commercial breaks, I guess that's how you would do like an open-ended thing. But I think there would be a really low tail end, a, a, a low enough volume on the tail end of the poll that you can almost think of it as, as basically a, a closed ended poll um, because there's, there's going to be so few votes on the tail end of it. Um, you would definitely close it by the end of the, the Super Bowl game. Um, it's, uh, I, I don't really think that would make a huge difference on how we handle this problem. Um, Although I guess if you're doing batch jobs, we, we, we can come back to that at the end, actually. That'll, that'll be something that we can cover more um, if we have time is um, close ended, um, time bound versus open ended poll. Yeah, so if we have time, uh, we can come back to that at the end. 
Um, can people change their vote? We're going to say that no, people cannot change their vote. Good question. Um, we're going to call this the constraints. Yeah, this is a section I don't usually cover. And actually, have caps law. Whoops. So that one's actually going to be an open ended constraint. And then we're going to have um, can't change your vote. If you were able to change your vote, that would definitely really change the design for this problem in a couple of different approaches that we would cover. So that is actually a really good call out that I didn't uh, think about a lot. Um, so the voter can see the current ongoing count before voting. Uh, yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, so you, you, it's it's real time. So it's kind of like how in the US presidential election you, you um, can, so there's poll workers outside US elections. So you don't actually know the result of the vote, I think necessarily, you just have these like poll workers outside. And so when you're watching CNN, I think that might actually be looking at the polls rather than the actual vote counts. Although I think there's also <coughs> districts reporting. Um, fun fact, when I was voting in the midterm election just a month or two ago, they actually called the Senate race for my state uh, before I even managed to get my vote in. Uh, that was, um, I waited like two hours in line too. That was pretty awful. <laughs> uh, so it, uh, it, was, it was not just that they could see the ongoing count and results of the vote while voting. They, they actually like the, um, what is it, routers or whatever had actually called the Senate election for my state before I even managed to vote. So it was, it was almost like a step more than just voters being able to see how things are trending. Uh, yeah, good questions. Okay, we can go ahead and move on to the numbers though for what scale I'm gonna be handling. I actually looked at this, uh, I looked up these numbers on my own is uh, 100 million people watch the Super Bowl. Um, we're gonna make an assumption that 10% of people complete a poll when it's shown. Um, that's probably a little on the high end, um, but it keeps it exciting. I like I like bigger numbers for the scale on uh, problems. So. Uh, this is probably a little high, but I think they'll keep this as an exciting problem. Um, next, we're going to assume that the poll request is shown at the start of a commercial break and that the results of the poll might be shown on the screen at the end of the commercial break um, with the break coming in at around five minutes, which is 300 seconds. Um, real time results could be shown to web page users throughout the whole thing. Um, I didn't, uh, we will explore that as one of the requirements. I didn't actually think through that one as much, um, if we have time. So we'll, we'll cover that if we have time. Um, and then, uh, the peak voting volume will be five times the average rate. Um, because I, I'd imagine as soon as you show it at the start of the commercial break, there's going to be a lot of people that just immediately go for it rather than people that load it up on their screen and then sit around for a couple of minutes and then fill it out. Um, so there's probably gonna be a pretty big peak right as soon as you show the poll. Um, so then the math came out to 10 million votes uh, because of the 10% thing. Um, 300 seconds for the commercial break um, means that if the 10 million votes occur over the course of the commercial break, it averages out to 33,000 TPS for the votes going in. Um, and a peak of 5x means that that peak is, uh, like I said, 5x the average rate. Um, that makes it around 165,000 for the TPS of the right operations, which is pretty high. Uh, yeah, so it's a pretty exciting number for this problem. You, you can't run it on one machine for sure. Uh, okay, we can go ahead and move into our uh, approaches next. Um, any questions before I hop into the diagram? Okay, yeah, we can go ahead and start with um, our first approach is um, here's these wonderful, um, these wonderful things called CRDTs, which um, basically solve the problem for us. Um, I'll go ahead and at least start with, uh, we, we need to get the browser for um, a voter. Um, and uh, they would have the page rendered. This was actually something that came up in Discord beforehand was the UUID thing for the sessions since they're not logged in or anything, you would still want to be able to dedupe those um, votes. So um, we're still gonna have um, 
I think we are going to need to talk to some kind of backend service. We can't just have the whole page come off of um, a, uh, a CDN. So, well, actually, so we, we could have a CDN for most of the page, and then you would get your dedupe idea off of a backend service. So this would be like a UUID provider service for the session. And then this is just the CDN up here. Okay, so you're first going to get the HTML and the JavaScript bundle off of your CDN. And then you would know to uh, make a call to a backend service off of um, the JS bundle, including the CDN will um, tell you uh, about a backend. And so then you would pull in a UUID from over there. And then you're going to go ahead and hit a backend service. So it's the vote, like you, you then have your poll, you're looking at it. Um, uh, so this is also assuming that you do not see what the current live results are before casting your vote. That would also, uh, we, we can maybe come back to that if we have time, um, the, the showing the results on the web page thing, uh, that would require another backend call. Um, so this is going to be the, uh, the right service for casting your vote. So it's the, the vote service. Um, yeah, I guess that's probably our best name for that. You know, but maybe I can think of a better name later. Um, so you're going to do a write operation to the vote service. And then we're going to eventually need to get it into some kind of data store where we're actually tracking the votes. So it is the vote data store. You can call it the vote casting service. That'll make sense. I want to distinguish it from like the vote viewing service or something. There we go. Okay, so we could do this directly to the vote data store. Um, for some other approaches, we might decouple it with a message broker or something, but I think to start with, we can, for, for Redis, Redis is really fast, so um, I think it's totally fair to just go ahead and talk to Redis straight away for, um, for that part. And then um, you're going to need to be able to view the votes um, at some point. Um, so uh, there's there's two different view scenarios. Is one is just hey the, the the current vote results show up on your TV screen, that being a very low volume of uh, read operations, versus if we're actually showing it on the web page. And um, I actually want to have uh, real time results on the web page as um, out of scope for now. We'll maybe come back to it at the end because um, having such a high that like like doing that would bring our read volume also up to be around 100,000 TPS. Um, which could um, change some of our, our approaches on the problem. So we're assuming right now that you, the real-time results are just shown on the TV screen, which brings our read volume way down. Um, there is the vote viewing service. And then you will have like a TV screen or something. So it is the uh, browser, you can just say, uh, TV screen for vote results. Okay, so vote viewing service. Actually, you would do some kind of aggregation, then somehow you're going to get it into the stream for your TV. Um, well, okay, so if we just have Redis, you don't need to do an aggregation over a whole bunch of different records. Um, you're just gonna to need to have something that'll pull it in and put it into somehow getting it up onto the TV screen. Um, I guess this is a pretty accurate diagram for now. Um, this isn't actually one of my favorite approaches. I'll show you some of the issues with it here in a couple of minutes, um, but we're gonna have our vote data store. And this one's going to be with Redis. We're going to be using um, Redis. Redis, which has CRDTs. There's only a couple of databases that actually support CRDTs. One of them is Redis. Um, another one is um, there's a uh, Rioc, I think is one, and Elastic. Uh, I don't remember if Elasticsearch does support it. Cosmos DB actually supports it a little bit. Cosmos DB from Azure does actually kind of support it. DynamoDB definitely does not. It strictly only supports um, last write wins, which is eventual consistency. But um, Cosmos supports um, causal dependent uh, causal consistency because you're allowed to um, write your own uh, conflict resolution thing for um, when there's a write conflict. 
Uh, and CRDTs are just special uh, conflict resolution uh, data structures. Um, so that's that's why I'm picking Redis in particular here is that it's one of the just very rare handful of data stores that actually do support CRDTs. And the one that we want to use here is called a grow counter. Um, can you give a quick overview of CRDTs? Uh, I'll give you some reading material. Is um, DIA, just look up uh, conflict, conflict free, uh, con what was it? Conflict free, conflict free, gosh darn it, okay. Conflict-free replicated data type. It's a thing that can solve the um, right conflicts on its own. We're not going to go too far into it um, because there's plenty of reading material on it. Another good book for that is um, Understanding uh, Distributed Systems. I've been reading this book a lot more lately. I've gotten through the majority of what I've wanted to, um, and I, I do actually kind of give a recommendation on this book uh, by Roberto Tio. I do actually recommend that book. I've, I've gotten through enough. If you've gotten through like 90% of DDIA uh, and like 90% of Alex Shoes books, and you're trying to figure out where to go to next, this one can really help with filling in some gaps, and it does have a section on CRDTs as well. Um, so it is it is actually a solid book. If if you've already made it through most of these two books, it's pretty good. I I've enjoyed it so far. Um, way less thick than DDIA though. You should definitely get DDIA first. Okay, so Redis supports a CRDT, and so you can actually have. Uh, we're going to use a grow counter. Um, so you can have a counter. It'll count something like 3,000 or something like that. It'll have some huge number. Um, and it'll have it for, you'll have like some kind of option. So it's a key value store. And so the key is going to be whatever option it is. And then that's going to map actually. So the best way to represent that is you'll have your, um, your option. And then it goes out to, uh, you'll have a counter for that option. And um, I don't think it will be enough to have just two things for um, Redis here. Um, and this is this also does not handle, this would not handle um, deduplication of votes. There's a couple of issues with CRDTs here. Um, and so that's, I'm actually gonna call this a little bit of a naive solution. It, it, handles, um, it handles the thread contention for us so well um, but there's, there's actually a couple of issues is that, uh, so I'll, I'll show a diagram here for, um, what the issue is. So this is a swim lane diagram is I think what it's called. Um, so you have, uh, these two lines and then we're going to have, um, we have some kind of back end service over here. This would be the vote casting service. And then we have our Redis uh, data store over here. And then we're gonna have our little box for um, the right operation as it hits that. Let's go ahead and give it pointed edges. I don't know why it wasn't doing that first. So you're going to make a call over to Redis. It's going to increment the counter and then it sends a reply. Well, what happens if you have an outage uh, here? If you get a dropped packet while you, uh, so you've, you've done your increment of the counter and then you're sending the packet back over the network from Redis to the vote casting service, it gets dropped. Um, so the vote casting service gets a 404 response back. Redis is properly incremented, but your vote casting service is gonna think that it has to do a retry. And so then it's going to send another packet over here and we get a double count of the vote. So I think that the CRDTs would actually not, um, it, it handles conflict resolution just fine, but I think that it would actually result in double counting some of the votes. So um, it's, uh, it's a wonderful solution for counters because it's, um, it handles thread contention super well. Um, but we would not be getting, um, we, would, we would have very poor uh, integrity 
of a revolt vote. That would that'd be the trade-off here is that if you don't care as much about the integrity of the vote and you're okay with people double voting, uh, this would work just fine. Um, but we actually did specify that we care enough about the integrity of the vote that we do care about um, the UUID thing for trying to deduplicate it for users. So that means that uh, this approach uh, as it is right now is not gonna be uh, good enough. We're gonna need to do something a little bit more than this. So that's our naive approach. Um, so next um, we're gonna talk about, uh, yeah, CR CRDT is just flat out. I Even with what I'm gonna do with the sharded counter, um, that is uh, just flat out not gonna work. Um, so next we're gonna talk about the sharded counter approach. So uh, we have this thing, the counter, and um, I think no matter what, you're, you're still gonna have an issue with uh, this. It's, it's, it's the, the, this thing. No matter what you do, you're going to have an issue with possibly getting a dropped thing there. So you need to make the operation um, item potent. You need to figure out how to make this operation item potent for uh, incrementing the counter. Um, I didn't even talk about how to shard it. I did say that two Redis instances wouldn't be enough. Um, so we you would have the option, and then you would also have um, a shard ID. I'm a little over the place, all over the place on uh, this problem right now. Uh, sorry. Um, so you're going to need to do the same thing with, um, if we switch to something where you're able to do, um, for, for making it item potent, we've, we've got this, and we, we need to turn this into like a multiple step operation in order to make it item potent. It'll look... Um, uh, if, if you guys were have, have seen the material that I put out on um, the off capture workflow, that's roughly what we're going to do here. We're going we're gonna to do something a little bit similar to the off capture workflow where we have um, two things going on. We're going to have, um, we're going to need to have two tables and um, it's going to have this thing that'll track whether or not we've, we've we're going to have something attached to this table that will track whether or not we've um, made an attempt to increment the counter. Um, so uh, we have the UUID, we're not actually doing anything with it yet. And so that is what we're gonna do for trying to improve the solution a little bit more, is that we're gonna have uh, this thing over here and I want to capture the UUID and we're gonna have a status for whether or not it's getting driven through. Um, so this will be the, uh, the UUID data store is what we're gonna call it for now. It's not gonna be Redis. Can't use that here. And so schema, we're gonna have, we have to store the UUID somewhere. We're gonna store it here. It's gonna look a little bit like this. Okay, so we're gonna store that. We'll have a status on it. So we're gonna be trying to drive the vote through uh, this other thing. So there's gonna be captured. Uh, we're gonna have status of incremented. And algorithms too. Okay. I know there's a couple of approximate algorithms out there. Like um, somebody had posted a link in the chat. I'm just going to paste it over here. Um, count and sketch is another approximate algorithm that we're going to maybe talk about that a little bit with Flink is I think that might be one of the streaming. I, I heard count and sketch is used with streams a lot. Um, TLW, hashing, sketching, hyperlog, log. Yep, you mentioned Countman sketch. Yeah, so we're going to maybe talk about that a little bit when I get to Flink. Okay, anyways, uh, so we've got this UUID. We're going to capture it, uh, and then it'll be involved in this other thing that's going to like drive through this count. We've got this counter. It's going to be a sharded counter. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, so you're going to have the counter, and then you're actually going to have a list of um, UUIDs. And so this whole thing is like one record. Um, so this actually gets moved inside of it. We're not going to be using Redis anymore since we don't need the um, CRDT from it. Um, so instead, we're going to be using whatever we want on this. So this chunk is going to get moved inside of the record it's not a key value store anymore. It's whatever we want it to be. 
Um, so we have the option that we're voting for. Let's make this a little bit less ambiguous, like what I mean by option. So it's uh, voting for which team that we think is going to win. And so let's say that it's uh, the Seahawks versus um, the Browns from Ohio. Uh, the Browns definitely are not going to win a Super Bowl. Um, so I think that's why they would maybe be an interesting choice. It would also make this more interesting because most people are going to be voting for the Seahawks because it, it, if you have the Seahawks and the Browns in a poll for the Super Bowl, the, Brown, the Browns would never make it to the Super Bowl is, is why this is funny. So that it would turn this into a hot partitioning issue. That's why I bring up the Browns, is that if you have the Browns, nobody's going to be voting for them in a, in a poll for which team would win. So you're not going to want to use um, the option as the partitioning key is, is why this would be amusing. I'm from Ohio. That's the only reason why I know that the Browns is a terrible team. So um, you have the counter at 23,000. And let's say that we've already like squashed it or something. Um, and then you've got this vote that's coming in. You're going to want to drive it through. And so you're going to capture, you, you, it would be, um, since the record is on one data store, you don't actually have to do any kind of distributed transaction here. And this is not going to be too, uh, uh, you'd be able to just in one write operation, add a UUID, and increment the count by one, because that's one right. You're just changing one record. It's not a distributed transaction at all. Um, so that's what, I'm, that's what I'm doing with the status here, is that um, th that's how we're making it item potent, is that you're going to have this captured status where you just capture it in the UID data store, and then you can return a 200 success. And then you're going to have an async operation that is going to convert this UUID record into a vote data store uh, increment. So um, it'll be... Um, everything else over here, we're going to turn into um, some async work. And so we are going to go ahead and take a uh, message broker and we're going to get that into the mix over here. So we're doing async work. So we have this. Uh, we want to have um, some task runners that are doing our async work. So we're going to have these, it's task runners. Set text to medium. Okay. So what I've done just now is that you have this guy, they have a UUID, they're submitting their vote. You write it over here to this data store and you stick a message on the broker and then you can return a 200 success. You don't have to do anything else. You, you, it's, it's, uh, that, that's all the work that's done um, before returning a 200 success to the browser. This stuff happens asynchronously where we convert their votes into um, an actual increment on the vote data store that actually gets viewed. Um, and uh, we did say that eventual consistency is good enough here. So it's totally fine that we're doing this async work and that we're returning 200 success because we do have, a, we, we did store it in our data store. It should be replicated uh, and persisted. Uh, it, it, it's a um, redundant um, persistence on, on like multiple different machines. We're, we're gonna have some kind of data store that's distributed and we'll replicate it and everything. And so there's no chance that their vote's not gonna get driven through um, to an increment as long as we've captured over here in this data store and stuck a thing on the broker. So that way that we have something that will do the work of converting it later. Um, and uh, yeah, we said eventual consistency. So this is fine enough over here. So we got that. Um, so we got the capture part. And then we want to talk about the increment. Um, we're going to have the UUID is also going to be stored on the message. That's going to be part of the message schema. So we've got the message that we'd have in Kafka or Kinesis or whatever. And um, so we got that, and that's how I can look up what you actually voted for over here. So this person voted for Seahawks. And so you got that. You don't need to store the um, option on there. Uh, you would do a read. You would do a read. Um, this is data flow area. So you do the request from the task runner to the data store. Um, 
And then you're going to take that and then you can go ahead and you would want to, you would want to read first, you would read the record and then you can go ahead and do a transaction for appending that onto the list. It'd be a single write operation where you append it onto the list and increment the counter because um, it's one record. So you can actually do that. And so, um, ah, actually, I think you can do, DynamoDB does support transactions. So I think you would do a transaction to DynamoDB or whatever data store you, you're, you're going to be using that supports transactions that would have, um, the transaction would have the read and the write operation in it. So it just locks that record. And um, so uh, this, is, this is going to be pessimistic locking here. Um, we already talked about an optimistic blocking uh, solution a little bit with Redis. Um, I, I, I don't think we, so th this issue would apply, I think, regardless of pessimistic versus optimistic blocking. Um, but um, in order to, it, it's, it's, you, you have to make the endpoint item potent. I think it's, it doesn't like, our CRDTs are just not really going to do anything for us after we make the operation item potent, which we kind of already walked through a little bit. Okay. Um, so we're going to do transactions. DynamoDB does support transactions. And um, so we would do that. That's one step of it. And then after we finished uh, incrementing it, that's the increment step. So uh, we had captured originally on that first write, and then we're reading it off of the message broker. And the first thing we do is um, we go over here, we look, is the UUID already there? That's how it's, that's how it's item potent is that if on the read part of that transaction, if you see the UUID already there, you would not have to increment the counter. You would just cancel the transaction. You'd skip over to the next step, which is converting, uh, you would then, uh, so you do this transaction and then you do step three, which is update the status to incremented. So you've incremented, uh, you, you've incremented over here and so you're gonna record the status over here and then you can go ahead and flatten the list. Uh, so after you've incremented that, go ahead and um, go back over here. And then you can go ahead and um, remove it from the list. And then you can say, uh, you would add another status of flat. You go back and you can go ahead and do another operation over there. Looks like a lot of stuff going on. This is like sagas is what I would call this. And um, you, maybe you would use um, AWS steps instead of task runners here. Like this is um, with, with task runners, that's like Lambda triggers or like AWS Lambda you probably want to use something more like AWS steps. Um, in, in that book by Roberto Vitio, he actually does have a check uh, a section on sagas. And he did actually say explicitly, AWS steps functions is a way to um, set up sagas. It, there, there's actually a specific page where he says AWS steps functions can actually be used for this. Uh, so that's another reason why I'm recommending this is I've been saying that for like a month. And then I finally saw like a written book that actually confirmed that what I'm doing is, is like a totally valid approach. I haven't seen anything in Alkshu's books that confirmed that. Uh, this guy said, yep, you can do that though. Uh, and he had some other great material in there. So that was, that was just very exciting for me. Um, yeah, so you, you might wanna use an orchestration component over here instead. And you would just do like these alternating transactions between these two things and, um, I, so I have the flatten step in there just because otherwise you're going to have this list get like thousands of records long, it, well, thousands of items long. Uh, so like this is the, the record. And if you let the UUID just keep accumulating like that, it'll have like thousands in it, depending on how much you shard it. Um, so you could have this uh, counter sharded into like a thousand uh, things. Um, you would need to track which one, which shard of your counter that you're doing your write to and which one you should be going back and forth through. I think you actually need to record the shard ID also on um, your UUID store because otherwise, how would you know between like this write operation, like going from here to here to back to here, how's it gonna make sure that it hits the same shard ID every single time? You're, you're gonna need to pick the shard, the same shard every single time if I'm, I'm pretty sure you would need to store it on the other one too. Um, and uh, okay, um, how many shards do we want here? 
I kind of want to calculate that. So we have two different teams and we're getting up to um, 165,000 per second, I think. And I think a record on DynamoDB cannot possibly handle 1,000 TPS. I, I'm pretty sure you cannot hit like 1,000 TPS in um, a single second for one record on DynamoDB. Um, 165 sounds kind of high for a single record, but I think I, I'm pretty sure that would be like a comfortable amount. Um, if we what 1,000 would definitely be high. I'm, I'm, I'm choosing between 165 shards and 1,000 shards. Um, and if we did 165 shards, that would be like 1,000 TPS per record. If it was 1,000 shards, we'd have 165 TPS per record. I like that number a lot more. So we're going to say that there's the shard ID is anywhere from 1 to 1,000. And so in, in our case, we're just going to say that it's shard number uh, 237. And so you're going back and forth between um, shard 237 over here. Uh, and that is what a sharded counter is. There's, there's going to be multiple records in the database for Seahawks that has a counter. And um, so there'll also be one for like 347. Um, and it also has a counter. And it should be evenly distributed. You, you should pick a random ID between 1 and 1,000. I think um, over here is probably a good place to pick it. And so then when you're doing your write to your data store, uh, you have, you, you do your first write over here with that random number between one and 1,000. It's, it's picked here. You don't want to have it picked in the browser, of course, because then you have opportunities for like DDoSing it, which is bad. Um, so uh, this is where you would pick that random ID for the shard ID. Okay. Is everyone following all right so far? Is there anything that I can clarify? Okay, I'm gonna take that as uh, no questions then. Okay, so we've got captured, we capture it. That's just over here. Let's put it on the queue, task runner's running. And um, first thing it does is it reads the record. This is uh, flowing this way because you're doing a read operation. Uh, you check your record. You see it should be in a captured status. If during that first read, you see it as incremented already, that would mean that you, um, you, you're, you, this is a retry of your operation. It'd mean that you already did the increment and that um, you failed after doing the increment, um, the, the task runner failed after doing the increment. And so it's restarting from the start. It's actually in the incremented step. And so you should not actually persist the UUID over here. You'd be skipping forward a little bit into the operation. Um, so you do the read, double check that it's captured. And then if it isn't captured, go ahead and write your ID over to the UUID list. Um, after And also increment your counter for the shard ID of that record. Uh, so after you've done that step, go ahead, go over here, uh, switch the status from captured to incremented. Um, and then you go over here and you can go ahead and flatten it. So you do the flatten transaction on um, this line. And then go ahead and uh, update your status from incremented to flattened. Uh, those are the steps, five steps. OK. And then uh, the counter should grow. And then this thing's going to do a read off of all the shards. It uh, reads all 1,000 shards, sums them up together. And then that is the result it gives back to wherever it's putting its results out to. That is our sharded counter approach. OK. Uh, there's also Flink. Um, so Flink would require reconciliation. Um, we've already got our stream here. Flink is a streaming analytics approach. Let's go ahead and, um, oh, I never specified a technology for these. Um, I'll, I just kept saying DynamoDB the whole time since I know that one supports transactions. So. DynamoDB for these for approach two, by the way. Let's go on to approach three, which is Flink. 
So you can similarly do this, and then um, you can have link added as another consumer off of that queue. So we're going to have another box for Flink. Take this. And we're going to say, OK, cool. It was actually writing. So we've got Flink here. You guys could probably hardly see what I'm typing. OK, so we've got Flink. And I want to make this smaller. So Flink reads off the end of the queue. And then it's um, for a stateful stream, it kind of keeps like a counter, like as it's having messages that it's going through. And then I think you would actually be able to just look right at that. And um, so then you would just have that instead. Um, but you might, I think it has a lot more of a risk of having um, double counting of votes, or it can have, um, I think you can have like straggler events. Um, so you would, you would at least need to do some kind of reconciliation process. Um, you could combine it with, um, this one's going to be a lot more slow moving. And then, so we have like a thousand shards for the Seahawks and a thousand shards for the Browns. And um, so you're probably, that, that would be a lot of records to read and aggregate together. So you might want to have like an aggregated data store as well. Um, in fact, that might have even made sense for approach number two to have an aggregated data store. And then you read off of that and you had like another, um, task runner between the vote data store and the aggregated data store. And then this one reads off the aggregated data store instead. Um, let me go ahead and show you that uh, really quick. So then we just have another task runner right here. that, have this, and we just have arrows just like that. And so instead of having to do a read off of 1,000 records, you would just have that happening in the background, and you would just go straight off the aggregated data store instead. Um, so that would introduce a lot more latency uh, between um, when you vote and when it actually shows up over here. But eventual consist consistency is just about having your results show up eventually. So this still like totally satisfies eventual consistency. It's just that like you'd have like another additional minute or so of, of delay, just depending on how frequently you're running this task runner to aggregate stuff between those 1,000 shards into a single consolidated counter shard over here. Um, so it's, it still is eventual consistency. I, I have no idea if that's really yeah it's it's it would it would probably be necessary to do that you don't want to be reading off a thousand shards uh every single well oh, oh okay so if you're going to do the phone real time thing that's when you would want to do this if you're just having off the tv if you just have the tv screen and you just have like that very low volume of reads then you don't need the aggregated data store that's totally unnecessary you would just introduce this if you're going to have the real time on the phones and you're having like 1000 reads per second as well as opposed to this, which is like a couple of reads per minute, like, you know, 0 0.2 TPS, if you're just doing the TV screen and you can't show it on the phones. But um, if you're doing 100,000 TPS reads from the phones also showing real-time data, then you would want to introduce this aggregated data store for approach two. Look, I did manage to get around to it. I'm really happy about that. Okay, let's get back to approach three. We got Flink, we got the aggregated data store. You can do, um, so Flink is probably gonna have some double counting on there. So uh, you can have it just looking at the last one minute of data and you just like slap that on top of the aggregated result that you'd have over here. 
Um, I want to copy what I had from here over to what I had going for my link solution. So you have your aggregations over here. And so then um, if you're going with the TV results, again, you can just go ahead and skip off of the aggregated results. Um, so if you're showing a result on the TV screen like every minute throughout the commercial break, um, you could maybe do Flink for the last minute plus the um, vote data store and you would do a read off of 1000 records. Um, another approach for making it a little bit more real time is that you could just, uh, and, and you had it for all the phones, you could just switch over to that. Um, I got a comment in the chat. Real time piece of this problem looks similar to a heavy hitters problem working with these count. Yes, it is heavy hitters. Yeah, I, I, it's it's a top K problem. We 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 have exactly something similar to the top K problem except you already know what the top K is, you just wanna know what the count is. Um, so that is something a little bit different is um, when, so for, uh, when you're doing something like amazon.com, what are the top five products sold in the last hour? You might not necessarily care about the count for those products getting sold uh, exactly precisely so much as just knowing what those five items are. Well, in our case, we already know what those top two items are because there's only two items, but you want to know um, a very accurate count. It is super similar to the heavy hitters problem. Yeah. And count min sketch is what I've heard um, is um, it's, it's commonly used in um, streams. It's an approximation algorithm. And um, so when you talk about eventual consistency, um, uh, when, when you say eventually consistency, that means that you're eventually going to get to the exact number. You're going to get to the exact number with eventual consistency. Um, uh, well, okay, so actually that there's an asterisk to that, which is that there is the last right wins thing. So if you do have right conflicts, there's the last right wins. And so you can actually get a little bit of inconsistency off of that. You're not actually going to get the right number if you have um, your right operations clobbering each other, um, that would be, um, if you want to handle that, it's called strong eventual consistency or strong convergence. CRDTs actually have strong convergence. And so they handle rights clobbering each other just fine, um, but they are not going to be able to handle uh, that situation. So even though it'll definitely capture every single vote that you send it when you when it processes, it still can't do anything about that 404 response. Um, but those those CRDTs actually have a stronger model of consistency than um, what DynamoDB would support out of the box by default. It's actually stronger than even uh, strong read consistency. So DynamoDB supports this thing called strong read consistency. Why does it specify the word read? It gives me the impression that maybe the rights aren't consistent. And well, if they are clobbering each other, it would fit that definition. So Redis with CRDTs is actually a stronger consistency model than uh, DynamoDB strong read consistency, at least my understanding so far. But again, this thing, the, the dropped response packet, you, it's, it's, uh, that means that you're still gonna get a, uh, a bad count with the implementation. Okay, uh, all right, let's try to get back on track. So I've got Flink here, you can adjust for it a little bit. So, I mean, you would, it's, I don't know if it's really that much better of a, you would, you, your number would be a little bit more frequently uh, incremented than if you're going off of um, just this alone. So all we really added between um, approach two and approach three is um, these three items right here. So if I just delete this, I'm gonna copy it. If I just do that, what we've got right now is approach two. Uh, this right here is approach two. Uh, we've just added flink right here, um, which means that instead of having these task runners run once every minute or whatever, we're also getting these results that are like live it's it's uh uh so you can do up to five reads per second off of a kafka shard 
Um, that's per shard. And so like if you have multiple shards, that means that you're going to have a little bit more higher, you're going to have a, a higher granularity of your updates than just once every 0 0.2 seconds. Um, so it's, you're, you're going to be getting more frequent, the, the number is going to be changing more frequently um, than if you just go off of um, this thing alone. So um, if you're going to be going with the phones, where they can see it live, just seeing that number on their screen increment once per minute might not be as satisfying as being able to see it update like multiple times per second. Um, so then you would maybe wanna have Flink in there if you're gonna be doing the phones. Um, I didn't talk about WebSockets at all. I mean, like if they're actually gonna view it incrementing like live on their phone, you could have it like refresh, they could like refresh their phone in order to see the, the, the new, number, but I think you would maybe want to have WebSockets. We'll, we'll get to that maybe at the end. We're going to have that as um, we'll see if we get time for that. For, for that. that would be fun. Okay. Uh, approach for aggregation, non-real time. Okay. This would be fun. Okay, I know what I'm going to do for for approach force. This is this is actually exactly the opposite of um, uh, when I was first thinking about this problem. I hadn't fully read through what the prompt that I was given was, which was um, I'd missed this aspect: display the results in real time. So, what if you're not doing real time though? Uh, so, approach four. What if you're not doing real time? What if you're just going to let them vote for five minutes, and then you show the result like right at the end of the five minutes? So this will be for approach four. That's what we're going to do here. Uh, and this is a lot simpler. This is way simpler. Um, so we're going to copy all of this. We're going to go down here for approach four. So you don't even need this thing. You don't even need that. You can go ahead and um, delete that data store completely. You don't need it. You're only going to need this one data store. You don't need that. We only need one data store in this case. So you're still going to use your UID. It still is going to prevent double counting. We're still going to be able to do that in this case. Um, I have no idea how much of this I'm really going to need. We'll ignore everything in the bottom half for now. So you're going to have the UUID still for deduping. You don't need the status anymore. You still need the option. Um, you don't need a shard at all because our primary key is going to be the UUID. And that's the only thing that we're going to index is just the UUID. I didn't go through the primary key or partitioning key at all um, for the other options. I gave you guys some pretty solid hints, though. Like, um, don't partition over the option for the, the Browns versus the Seahawks, because that's going to be lopsided and give you a hot partition issue. Um, in this one, you don't have to worry at all about this. You're going to have uh, the UUID as the primary key and um, partition key. We're not going to need any kind of sort key. And then um, it's just going to sponge all of them up. Uh, DynamoDB would not be the optimal data store for this. You're actually going to want to use Cassandra. She uses an LSM tree, so it's really optimized for write-heavy um, use cases because we're going to have 167,000 writes per second. We're going to have um, 0. We're going to have 0.01 reads per second or something. So our, our uh, write TPS is going to be 33K to 165K. And our read TPS is going to be 0 0.001. Because it's going to be a batch read. Yeah, feel free to drop off. I'm going to upload it to, to YouTube. Um, I think this is a lot more um, engaging, though, for people that watch these things live. So it could also be a, a bloom filter. Um, a bloom filter. So Cassandra has a bloom filter built in. Yeah, uh, Cassandra has a bloom filter built into it. Um, I don't know if that 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 helps with um, speeding up the write operation. That would help with speeding up the the deduping op uh, operation. Um, on its own, it does not. Uh, on its own, it's not a full solution. I think you would you would want to use it on top of um, there's there's like other stuff you need to have going on. I think than just throwing a bloom filter at it. 
Um, but Cassandra does use one of those. Cassandra does use a Bloom filter. So that would, that would help us with the UUID part um, for uh, deduping. Um, so we have this, and we're going to have one big batched read after four or five minutes. Um, so we're going to have this. And um, Cassandra has really nice integration with um, MapReduce. Um, and that's, that's what we're going to have right here, is that we're going to have a big MapReduce operation. So you could even have it um, cut off the voting after, uh, so you're, you're letting this whole thing run for four minutes straight or five minutes straight. And then you go, Oop, we're done voting. And then you go ahead and flip on the MapReduce operation. It starts um, aggregating up all of the records. And then when it's done, you go ahead and spit out the result over to um, uh, MapReduce's weird uh, with, with how it handles um, storage and CPUs. I think MapReduce uses this model of um, you bring the compute to where the storage is or something. There's, there's like a couple of different models that are, it's, it's uh, the, the white papers surrounding BigQuery and MapReduce and um, Dremel very fascinating. It's, it's around like storage bound stuff. I think this traditionally is a model of where you move the compute to like where the actual storage is. And then you have, you have the output and you actually write that out to a different data store entirely. So you would technically have another data store here. You would have the output data store if you're going to do a MapReduce job. And then, um, so you do a write operation to over here. And then this thing is gonna be like a cron job or something. If it's for the TV screen, it's gonna be something like a cron job. It does a read operation of this. It's gonna go like that. And then you have it show up on the TV screen and it, it just puts it to however the live streaming stuff works for cable TV. Yeah, okay. I think that handles all four approaches. Um, any questions for anybody? Cool. All right. Uh, let me add that arrow back in. Um, I think I've handled everything I wanted. Oh, there's the WebSockets for the live updating number. I've handled live uh, WebSockets in a couple of other problems before, and it's not really the most interesting aspect of this problem. So I think I'm just going to skip that. Um, I think I'm. I, I want to skip that too, since we're over an hour into this thing. Yeah, I think I can cut it here. Uh, thanks for joining me, guys. I'll let you all go. Um, I'll upload this onto YouTube, of course, later on. If you guys have any other questions afterwards, uh, I'm going to start up a Discord thread in the forum discussion section. Um, so feel free to comment there if you have any questions after we uh, end the uh, Zoom meeting. Um, yeah, thanks again for joining. I'll let you guys go.